So good morning and afternoon. If you're anywhere uh, the other side of the Rockies, uh, welcome. My name is Brandon Valante from Candy Learn, and I'm welcome and actually cajoled, invited, was polite and to have Lisa come uh, as well to join into the sessions here. Lisa is a technology strategist, Kwantlen at, at Polytechnic University, and we connected through Elizabeth Childs at Royal Roads. Uh, and Lisa's done some fantastic research on Gulf Islands. So I will not take anything away from what she's gonna share here as well. So uh, without further ado, Lisa, take it away. Yeah, yeah so I am Lisa Gadak, as Randy said, and I am a teaching and learning with technology strategist in a post-secondary context, but am doing uh, research in a K-12 context in a very unique district. Uh, today, I would like to give you a overview of my research in a video that Randy is going to uh, play for me. And then I would like to take you through uh, an appreciative inquiry process where we actually will reimagine your context in the future and potential possibilities there. So I'm very excited about the session and uh, thank you all for coming. Randy, I can stop sharing my screen so that you can share the video. And hello, Elizabeth. <laughs> Sorry, I did it again because I forgot to optimize. Yes. That's, that's a page of complete issue for me. Okay, we're good. So now, hang on, get the other desktop. Hi, I'm Lisa Gadak, and I would like to share an overview of my research entitled Strengths and Superpowers, Revolutionary Experiences of School District 64 During the COVID-19 Pivot. My study focused on one distinctive K-12 school district in BC that's situated in the Pacific Northwest Salish Sea, or the Strait of Georgia, and the configuration of this district is distinct and complex, with some students taking water taxis or personal watercraft to access their face-to-face class. Oh, we've lost the sound there, Randy. Albeit in higher ed, I've been fascinated by this configuration and curious about the ways that education in this region was being delivered. As I mentioned, I'm positioned in a higher educational context. I have a teaching background in post-secondary courses and my current role is a learning with technology strategist. I'm passionate about the intersection of learning and tech. So why was I interested in doing research in a K-12 context? Well, that brings me to my second reason. The students that I see are the students that were in K-12 yesterday, and what they learn throughout that time shapes them. I deeply believe that we learn lifelong and that the experiences that we scaffold for students in K-12 will allow them to become their best selves. When COVID hit, the schools closed their doors and teachers and students were thrust into a new reality of learning remotely. The challenges that they faced were not new, but they were amplified during this time. And I was aware of these issues. I imagined that this unique district had unique challenges. But I couldn't help but think that this was an opportunity, a once in a lifetime chance to examine what went well during this time. And so I asked myself, how might access to K-12 learning opportunities be reimagined in School District 64 post COVID-19 to deliver education across its distinct physical locations. The theoretical framework or the structure that supported my study was constructivism. I also implemented two tech integration models to further frame this study and to provide a context into the constructed perceptions around technology use. This research used a qualitative case study bound by the parameters of the district and focused on a particular period of learning remotely during the phenomenon of the COVID pandemic. I used an appreciative inquiry approach for this case study. Appreciative inquiry or AI is a strength based framework that theorizes that people construct their realities good or bad together and that by collectively imagining a positive future, 
current action is inspired. AI proposes that positive questions lead to positive change and we can focus on what we want to grow. I wanted to include the voices of all stakeholders, so I invited teachers, students over the age of 18, parents, administrators, and staff to participate in this study, and I had 67 participants across all of my different data collection methods. My data for the study was collected using three methods, an online research survey, a mini focus group session, and one-on-one -on -one interviews that were held on Zoom. The survey aligned to the tech integration models that framed the study, and the focus group session and one-on-one -on -one interviews used an AI interview tool to be positively focused. Four central themes emerged in my preliminary findings. Reciprocal learning, teachers expressed a desire to learn from and with each other, and organically during this time they formed networks of support among one another. Parents, who were suddenly enlisted in becoming co-facilitators of their children's learning, expressed the desire to be more involved in their children's learning experiences in the future. And students were learning from and with one another. Several teacher participants noted the potential benefits of students learning together across topics and grades, more collaboratively, and in connection with the community. The adoption of tech was another theme, with 77% of the teachers surveyed indicating that the pivot caused them to think more deeply about how tech could influence their teaching approaches, and there was a strong desire to integrate tech to support pedagogy. Across all roles, tech was found useful in maintaining communication and engaging learners, for providing flexibility, especially for the older students in the higher grades. Reimagining the curriculum was a theme that emerged and there was much optimism about the future of delivery. Many participants expressed a desire for more flexible, personalized learning, experiential learning, reimagining how assessments and feedback could look, providing more learner choice and learner generated content, and incorporating a pedagogy of care, more holistic approaches, and including health and wellness in the curriculum. Finally, another theme of creating engaging experiences emerged, and tech enhan enhanced practices, digital tools, reimagining activities, assessments, and delivery modes during remote learning allowed teachers to think outside the box to support and to create engaging experiences. I am grateful to the participants in this survey who shared their experiences, their stories, and their vision of the future for School District 64. To them, I would like to express my appreciation. Thank you. Hey, thank you for sharing that on my behalf, Randy. I am just going to pop my slides back up and move it to Oh, I am actually missing a slide for some reason. I must be using my other slide deck. Um, that's okay. I'm just going to move forward with this one. It is one slide that I'm actually missing where it really tied with the keynote of Dr. Bates today. So looking at, um, I actually cited from the Commonwealth last year in December, where Dr. Bates actually, a lot of these preliminary findings have uh, tied to that. Now, online learning in Canada is not new. It has been here for 30 years. Dr. Bates is one of the seminal um, authors of constructing frameworks on how to learn online. Um, but there's definitely some uh, some some really close linkages to things that I was studying. And so I like one of the quotes that um, Dr. Bates did say is that learning is developmental and teachers are like gardeners. The plants do the growing, but the teachers create the environment, the soil, how it gets its sunlight and school should be the same way. And I absolutely loved that quote by uh, Dr. Bates. Um, now the participants in this particular study were asked, they were they were presented this scenario that they had just awakened from a long sleep. And as they woke and looked around that school district 64 was just as they had always wished and dreamed that it would be. So what was happening in the district and how was the district different? And today that is what I would like to do with you as a group is think about what your imagined future looks like. And I'm just going to minimize my, um, there we go, that time. 
little tile there was distracting. So we're gonna do some break, uh, breakout group. And essentially what I'd like you to do is choose where to focus your imagination. So it'll be a choose your own adventure breakout group um, sessions where based on the preliminary themes found in this study. So reciprocal learning, adoption of technology, creating engaging experiences and reimagining the curriculum. What if you woke up suddenly and could imagine that it was optimized in your school or your school district? What would this look like? Of course, it will take processes now for us to be able to reach that preferred future, but just to be able to imagine freely what that could po possibly look like in your own context. When we return, I would love to discuss all of the highlights. I'm also going to provide a link to a Padlet so that we can capture all of the thoughts and the key takeaways, uh, which I'll share out with the audience after. Uh, then we can of course discuss the highlights and I would love to answer questions about my research at that time as well. So imagining our preferred future and again it's going to be participant choice as far as where you decide to spend your time. Um, reciprocal learning will be room number one, the adoption of technology will be room number two, reimagining the curriculum will be re, uh, room number three, and creating engaging experiences will be room number four. So I'm just going to stop sharing here. There we go. And um, yes, and I'm just trying to see now we have 11 participants in here. Actually, Randy, I had given you a um, poll prior to the, uh, the session today. And I'm wondering actually if you have that handy. Um, 20 minutes to imagine, Elizabeth. Uh, that is, uh, we're still on track. So yeah, 20 minutes would be the imagining part of this. Now I'm gonna actually launch a poll because of uh, it being 11 of us in here. Um, I'm wondering if how many people would be actually in each room. I think we should do that. If we launch a poll and then we pick the top three choices, yeah. uh, oh, that will make a much game. richer discussion. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. So if you don't mind launching that poll for me, that'd be great. So wherever you feel that uh, you would like to imagine in your context, one of these particular themes, uh, and then we will create those rooms. You can see the responses are coming in. Wonderful. It's actually interesting to look at the results of this um, poll. Uh, so the three most um, interesting topics to this crowd, creating engaging experiences, the adoption of technology and reciprocal learning. So um, creating engaging experiences will be room number one. The adoption of technology will be room number two and reciprocal learning will be room number three. And I can pop that in the chat as well. Um, and I will just create these breakout rooms. Um, or maybe I don't have the, the power here to create the breakout rooms. It looks like I don't have that function, Randy. Okay, setting them up. So wonderful. Uh, participants can choose where they're gonna go. Yeah, choose your own adventure. So yes, room one will be the creating engaging experiences. Room two will be the adoption of technology. I'm just putting these in the chat right now. And then uh, room three, room number one, and room number three will be the, um, uh, not reimagining the curriculum. What was the, the other one? It wasn't reimagining the curriculum. It was the uh, reciprocal learning. Yes, reciprocal learning. Yes, so I've absolutely. opened the rooms. Wonderful. So you're able to go in as well. Thank you. Experiences and then two is adoption of tech. And three is reciprocal. Learning. Yes, and I will pop in and say hello and make sure that people have gotten to where they would like to be. Hey, I think now I have the um, the ability. Okay, they've all jumped in, so we're good. Just Aaron is in here. Aaron, do you, if you are there, you want to jump into a particular room? Can you put me in room number two? <laughs> I have no okay. idea how to do that. Okay, no worries. Thanks. That'd be great. And then Toby will be. Okay, she's in. So there we go. Okay, Elizabeth, wonderful. You... So we have um, at least pairs. Elizabeth, can you jump into a room that you want, or you need me to assign you? 
Oh no, I can do that in a second, but I have a really ridiculous. Okay. Aha, uh -huh. wonderful. Okay, welcome back. Um, I definitely heard a lot of really interesting and cool discussions happening when I popped into all three of those rooms. Um, Randy and I were just talking about the fact it is, uh, you know, awesome to be able to dream without those boundaries. Uh, obviously, it takes process and action in order to make these things a reality. Um, but before we actually get into discussing and sharing out some of this awesome stuff that you discussed, uh, I did find my right slide deck while you were in your breakouts. And I just wanted to draw some of the parallels from last year's presentation, which of course was reiterated, if not amplified by Dr. Bates's keynote, um, is that schools will need Wi-Fi. Like there's infrastructure is needed. So so extra cost is, is going to be involved, but it is an investment that needs to happen. And not everything has to be blended or online, but a third or 30% of teachers really should be trained and be champions in this thing. Uh, as I mentioned, this isn't new. It's it's There are research-based best practices around this, but often people are unaware of them. The teachers, the administrators, unaware of how to um, about these practices, adopting the same tools and tech and networks uh, is very important, so that people are familiar and they're not bouncing between different foreign spaces that they may not necessarily be um, familiar with, and various delivery models, which uh, in fact includes uh, the teacher themselves. Uh, if you were to talk to Dr. Bates about that, and different delivery models and mechanisms and tools um, can make learning more equitable. All students, regardless of the level or the grade, uh, will need knowledge management. They need to know how to find, evaluate, organize, and apply information and tie it to the real world. Uh, and there is that quote that I had dug up because I really do love that about teachers being gardeners. The plants are the ones that do the growing and we of course help them get there. So um, Let's jump ahead here. Now I've got to move my tile onto this side. We'll do the hokey pokey and turn ourselves about. Envisioning our positive action, our positive future, because positive images can inspire positive action. Um, and so that's where we've left off. In the chat, I have plopped a link to this Padlet, and I've put headings for the different themes that have emerged uh, in my research. And what I'd like to do now is just take a couple of minutes um, for the, the various participants to sort of plunk your key takeaways here. Maybe there was some quotable quotes uh, that you heard or, or uh, some really interesting things that have arisen in those discussions. So if you plunk the key takeaways there over the next couple of minutes, I will make sure that a copy of this gets out to the audience as well. I am just going to uh, stop sharing my screen. Yeah, and I reposted the link there just in case people came in late. Wonderful. Yes, thanks so much. And if you did come in late, you can certainly contribute to the Padlet as well. These are the themes that were preliminary findings from the research I conducted in a K-12 context, where people were asked to dream, essentially, about the future, their preferred future in their district, and what education could look like if it was optimized. And so these are four of the um, big umbrella themes that have come out from those preliminary findings that teachers did want to learn from and with one another, uh, have more parental involvement, students possibly learning across grades, across topics. Um, adoption of technology, clearly technology, tech enhanced practices uh, were needed, but there's different skill levels that are required for that. So even if you weren't here for the breakout sessions where people were asked to, if you woke up tomorrow and the district was perfect or your school was perfect, what would make it perfect? Why was it perfect? So feel free to contribute to those headings. Um, if you woke up and it was perfect with those particular aspects, why? What would make it perfect? Forget about the process that we need and the resources that we need to get there. Um, dream big. What, what would it look like if it was perfect? And while we're uh, populating the Padlet, if anyone has any questions, that's sort of where we're at now. We've got 10 minutes remaining in the session. Um, I definitely would love to hear some of the key takeaways from each of those rooms. Um, and I recognize that you're typing. So maybe right now, if we just uh, put it out there, if there's questions or general comments that anybody has. I think you've got everyone interested and active. Lisa, good job. I, excellent. I can see the smoke. Yes. <laughs> I 
I just added the link while folks are typing um, to a study that was done. It's a bit dated now, but the the frame is very, very useful around in student engagement. Mm -hmm. And the Canadian Educational Association did it in 2009 around academic engagement, social engagement, and intellectual engagement. And they have very um, clear definitions about those three categories. And when I've used it in some of my work with educators, people have found it to be helpful to use that as a lens as they're creating programs, courses, or activities through which they view engagement. What mm -hmm. types of work am I doing in these courses that would meet the academic engagement requirement versus the intellectual engagement or the social engagement? So it's another way to frame the notion of engagement. I thought people might find it useful. So I've just stuck it in the chat and in the Padlet. Awesome. Yeah, and that's one thing that connected in my research with uh, Dr. Bates as well is the fact that these frameworks and um, research established best practices are are there, but people don't know how to access them, um, or they may not be aware of them. And I'll move that out of the way and close that, but uh, we can put the Padlet right up here as well. There's that resource Elizabeth has put up. The lonely room of reimagining the curriculum. I wonder, is there anyone in here that has any thoughts on that that they wanted to share or anything that maybe was tied to the other umbrella themes that would come out in the wash as being reimagining the curriculum? Well, I was saying to Aaron that I really liked that uh, example the other day of the girl that applied to USC she didn't get in, but she had this huge portfolio of digital work. Um, I guess I think she wanted to be a reporter or a journalist or something. And so by creating that, by creating that body of work, it got her into the school. Um, so I think, I mean, the ABST curriculum that we have in DC, I think uh, allows for that kind of thing, but um, like having, having more of a focus on kids creating a portfolio of work mm -hmm. that applies to like the real world that could get them a job or get into university. Um, I, know, I know that that's what blogging and portfolios is meant to be, but um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. And really, uh, in post-secondary, we are working a lot with uh, e-portfolios and folio thinking. And of course, by collecting and reflecting and um, sharing their work for assessment and feedback, um, there's a lot of deep learning that can happen with e-portfolios. But just as uh, you know, we mentioned these structures and frameworks that are out there to support best practices, it does take some thoughtful integration um, to implement e-portfolios in a meaningful way. So they can be a, an, ex, an excellent uh, example of how students can demonstrate their learning in an alternate way and have some really deep reflection opportunities when we structure it really well. Yeah, well, and for, I think someone made this point. Um, maybe George made this point yesterday, like one year you'll have a teacher that's all about portfolios, and the next year you don't, and the next year you don't, and the next year you do, and it, it's so spotty, right? There's no... And then like, you know, one year they use FreshGrade, the next year they use whatever, edge of blogs, the next year they use, you know, there isn't yeah. like a, 
it's so true. It's to Tony's point, right? We need to have common networks, common tools. We need to be able to have familiarity with these things so that teachers and students are comfortable and it's not just sporadic and intermittent yeah. and fractured. Yeah. But then on the other hand, as a teacher, the <laughs> province says, you must use X. And I'm like, oh, I don't like X. I like Y. <laughs> It's very complex. There's no question. Now, in your dream, of course, you you didn't have to worry about any of that. You could <laughs> imagine the school however you would like it, however Toby would like it. <laughs> yeah. You, you know that, that that brings up an interesting point because I I used to I used to preach being tool agnostic, like that was a big thing. You know, like hey, find the tool that works for you. It doesn't really matter. Um, but one of the things that the pandemic showed was you know we we moved to being a Microsoft school, the uh, school district, and having every kid be able to have teams and every kid be able to have, you know, uh, a set of tools that, that were common, I think leapt our district forward significantly because, mm -hmm. w because we knew that a kid at home could download uh, Word or PowerPoint or whatever. And it didn't mean that a kid that really wanted to couldn't use some other tool, say, to present. But giving everybody that base of tools, and it doesn't matter, you know, online, it doesn't matter if it's Blackboard, it doesn't matter if it's Canvas, it doesn't matter if it's Moodle. What mm -hmm. matters is that um, you create a lot of uh, challenge when a kid's signing into one course and they have to, they have, you know, they're using Padlet here and they're using, um, you know, Microsoft uh, Moodle for this course, but then they have to, you know, navigate uh, Blackboard for this other one. And I think that there is something to be said about having some consistency and providing mm -hmm. that as a backdrop. And from that point, if kids want to then have their freedom to have it. But I, 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 I really, you know, the, the pandemic taught me that having a base foundation of everybody having the same tools makes a huge difference. Absolutely. We really do make a lot of assumptions about our students, um, regardless of the grade level, uh, that they're tech savvy and they have access to all of these things and that their view is our view, that the way that we view the screen is the way that they view the screen. And of course, we know now that that's not true, um, that they may not necessarily have access. So to be able to level at the playing field and have um, the same devices is an absolute game changer. So I am mindful of the time, Randy. I know we've got about one minute left in this session. So are there any sort of final questions or comments? I'm very happy that uh, you are here and I could share this research with you today. Um, and I thank you for participating and, and definitely leaning into that activity as I went into the rooms. Um, there were some awesome conversations happening. Um, but please, any final comments or questions? Okay. Well, I'm going to ask one, oh, sure. Go Lisa, ahead. I'm going to ask one question yes. um, and it's about your research actually, because I think maybe some people would like to hear a little bit more about that. Um, what's one thing, if you had sort of the one takeaway that you want this, I mean, this is your audience, right? These are people doing this good work and have been doing it throughout a global pandemic and will continue to. So what's yeah. one thing you really want them to take away from the work that you did that you think could be helpful as they move forward? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, well, first of all, I mean, just to be in the business that you're in, it comes from such a place of caring and concern. You genuinely care about your students and want to give them the best experiences. There's no question. Um, and so I would say that you don't have to recreate the wheel. Uh, we've all kind of been operating like a duck on the water and our feet are going like mad underneath and we look like we're smooth as silk on the top most of the time. Um, but there's a lot of help out there. So I talk about the frameworks and structures that are already in existence. If we're looking at implementing technology, for example, there's some really great technology integration models uh, like SAMR or uh, TAM or TPAC that can help you. But there's also a plethora of open educational resources, for example. So instead of recreating the wheel, um, make sure that you really look to what's there. And there's champions out there that want to help you. There are instructors in my research alone, I indicated that about a quarter of the teachers surveyed felt comfortable enough with technology that they would be willing to be leaders in their school in helping others to adopt technology to support their pedagogy. So really, I think the biggest takeaway is you're not alone. And there is a lot of resources and frameworks that are out there to lean on and people to lean on people resources. <laughs> 
Right. Thank you. Well, everyone enjoy the rest of their uh, the conference today. I know I am excited for the upcoming sessions. <laughs> thank you all. Well, thank you, Lisa. That was great. I really appreciate that. And uh, you know, we're always curious about what is actually going on, particularly. I think that a lot of us who are close to the island or Salish are always concerned about what's going on in the mm -hmm. Gulf Islands. So really mm -hmm. do appreciate uh, that update as well in the research. And it, it rung the same themes that we've heard consistently through this week. So thank you so very much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs>